My name is Aaron Stonish. I am a co-founder and designer at Four Kitchens. Uh, we're a Drupal consulting uh, firm in Austin, Texas. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about the state of web topography. It's come a long way and I think we're finally at a good point where um, all the kind of technologies are finally converging. So it's very exciting. Uh, so first we're going to start out with a little bit of history. Um, if you are familiar with the font face uh, rule for CSS, you may not be aware that it's actually been around since 1997. Um, a little bit of history, I was going to talk a little bit about uh, a little background information about the, some of the different technologies we'll be talking about today. There's a lot of acronyms about font formats and things like that, so I just want to make sure everybody's um, familiar with those. Um, one of the ones we'll be talking about is called the EOT font format, it stands for Embedded Open Type. Uh, it was created by, by Microsoft um, so that they could use the font face rule back when they released Internet Explorer 4. Um, it's sort of wrapping a true type font to the standard TTF fonts that you're familiar with on desktops, except they would wrap it up in their own DRM so that um, when you embed it on a website, the user wouldn't be able to cleanly just go ahead and uh, pirate it from the website. Uh, but the, So they've used it in every um, um, browser since IE4. Uh, they've supported it in every one since. But it never really picked up steam because it's always proprietary, and it's only it's been the only browser that would ever support this format. Um, so true type, I think uh, most designers are familiar with this. this is the standard uh, desktop format for fonts that you work with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, OTF uh, stands for Open Type. Uh, this is kind of the successor to true type formats. It allowed for um, much more glyphs. Um, in a font, as well as getting more complicated uh, kerning and ligatures and other kind of um, variations on a font. SVG is something that you'll actually see when um, dealing with embedding, uh, embedding font formats for websites. Um, it's not actually a font format. Um, it stands for Scalable Vector Graphics, and it's more closely more, more closely related to like um, like an EPS or like Vector uh, Illustrator format. Um, the reason we t we'll be talking about it today is that um, up until iOS 4.2, SVG was the only way to deliver web fonts to uh, iPhones and iPads. Um, the next really exciting web font format uh, is WAF, uh, stands for Web Open Font Format. Um, there's actually a rough draft as of 2010 to actually get it into the W3C <coughs> standard um, Firefox and uh, Internet Explorer 9 uh, support it now. Um, it's very popular with foundries because you can actually contain ownership information in it. And a lot of uh, web designers and web developers like it because it's compressed. So it has a very small size and can be delivered quickly. So now we'll talk a little bit about the history. So back, as I mentioned, uh, back in 1997, uh, CSS2 standard uh, introduced the font face rule for embedding uh, fonts and web pages. Uh, Microsoft quickly followed suit and included support for font face uh, with Internet Explorer 4, uh, but they only supported their own proprietary format, the uh, EOT. Then we skip ahead, um, you know, 10 years later, Safari 3.1 is the first browser um, besides Internet Explorer to support font face, and they supported uh, true type fonts uh, and open type. Uh, a year later, Firefox 3.5 um, will support the font face rule. Then uh, just last year, Chrome finally got on board uh, and they, will, they started supporting it. And then as of Firefox 3.6, uh, Chrome 6, and IE 9, um, they all support this new uh, WAF format. And then that's actually, um, like I said, there's a working draft uh, as of last year to actually get that into um, an officially recognized standard. And I think that's what's really going to, where we're finally going to see, um, in, in this demo later, I'm going to be showing you uh, the methods, and you'll see that when, even if we're declaring one font face rule, you have to do a bunch of different formats. So it works in all the different browsers. But now that IE9 and Firefox are on board, I think Chrome is going to be forced to accept this wall format. Um, 
so we're, we're finally getting to one format that we can just deal with that one and it'll make um, writing uh, CSS code a lot easier. Um, so before font face was widely supported, uh, you may be familiar with some other technologies that have come along. Um, the one that kind of came out first was called Cipher. Uh, it was an image replacement that actually used Flash. Um, it was liked by foundries because there was no way to like reverse download the source font or reverse engineer it, it was, or if you could do it, it was very complicated. Um, a lot of web designers and web developers didn't really like it because you couldn't do text selection, so it was very bad for SEO. Um, you know, Flash is obviously uh, has some drain on resources. So, but it was all it was all, it was all designers had for a long time, so that was kind of what people used. Um, a few, uh, a little bit after that, uh, this technology Kufon kind of came. Uh, has anyone actually heard of Kufon? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. Great. Um, yeah. This was the one that w when it came along, it kind of pushed Cipher out the door. Uh, it was very. It still relied on uh, JavaScript, so it wasn't pure CSS, but it was much more lightweight than Flash. Um, the only problem was either it was too new or people still felt like you could reverse engineer the JavaScript. The foundries were still like the crux and not really letting this thing come to light. So I was like, here we have this awesome technology, but you know, the font foundries, people on the fonts are the ultimately gatekeepers for licensing their fonts. And if they don't trust the technology, then you know, they're not gonna allow their fonts to be used for it. But luckily, we don't have to worry about that anymore because now we have the font face rule and it's just pure CSS. Uh, they have to implement. Um, so here's what it looks like in its most pure form. Um, you declare the font family, and this is whatever you want to name it. You know, it makes sense to name it after the font, but if you have you know different variations of it, it's like whatever makes sense to you. If you want to use a shortcut to call it, that's that's your name. That's your name. So you can call it whatever you want, and then the source is where you tell the CSS where to point to the actual physical file. So this implementation would actually work for any browser that supports true type fonts. Um, but as we'll get into a little bit later, that's not quite the case. Um, but this, this is just an illustration of the most simplest, uh, simplest uh, implementation. <clears throat> so I think we're all familiar with um, all of the, <laughs> the myriad fonts that we had available to us as designers uh, before. Um, font replacement came around. Um, it basically looked like this, and if you're a designer, it's pretty. It was a pretty sad state of affairs. Um, obviously, not a lot of exciting choices, except for maybe Comic Sans. Um, but here now, uh, this is kind of a great example of what we can do now. This is a page uh, that some guys put together. Is it Paravel? Uh, Zach's not here. Um, um, this really awesome design company called Paravel. Um, and they put together this website called Lost Worlds Fair, and it was an example of kind of what you could do um, with the, all the new exciting uh, web font technologies. So uh, I put a URL down there. Uh, definitely go check out the different pages, um, and obviously you can see you have some really uh, beautiful results. Okay, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, where to get fonts, um, just because there's some uh, new resources that are coming out that are uh, pretty exciting. Um, obviously, the one uh, a lot of us are familiar with is, are getting commercial uh, licensed fonts from the foundries. Um, here's a few of the most uh, popular ones. Um, there's also a few websites that kind of aggregate all of these fonts, and so it's like a one-stop shop. You sign up for an account, and they have you know hundreds and hundreds of fonts, and you can just buy them kind of all the cart from all the different foundries. So those are a really great resource. Um, so related to licensing, um, the, the way to sum, <laughs> sum up the current state of affairs for web font licensing is it's complicated. Um, like I said, the foundries are the gatekeepers. They ultimately control uh, which licensing they accept. And it's really complicated. And it's, it's kind of unfair because we have all these really awesome technologies that are coming out and we want they work really well and you know it's CSS only especially you know font face but they don't quite trust um, you know they don't want people just to be able to steal their fonts you know they charge 
hundred, two hundred dollars for a, a single font, and if those get pirated, you know, it's they're out of luck. So um, I put a URL, URL here in the bottom, uh, webfonts.info. This is a really great resource, and they built this table that kind of shows where people are at. Um, if you go to an individual Font Foundry's page, they'll usually have a pretty uh, in-depth um, article about how their fonts can be used. Um, so that's probably the best resource if there's a specific foundry that you like. Go read their uh, terms of use and they'll, they'll tell you how they like their stuff to be used. Um, there's also uh, an exciting movement of free and open source fonts and I'm not talking about a thousand freefonts.com. Like, actually, these are actually high high quality free fonts that you can get. And Font Squirrel, I definitely recommend. Um, I believe the guy that runs the site, his name is Ethan, and he does a really good job of him and his company handpicking all these high quality free fonts for you to use on their site. Um, and they're the best thing is they're all licensed for free um, for commercial use. Um, <clears throat> uh, another website that's you may be familiar with is the Google Web Fonts. Uh, what they are doing is actually a combination of things. They're actually serving as a repository for fonts for you to download. So you can actually download the actual font to your desktop and you can use it um, you know in desktop publishing or on you know websites. But they also have a really interesting service where they'll actually host their fonts from their website. And so all you have to do is go on their site and grab a little snippet of uh, JavaScript and um, they have a little code snippets and you just insert that into your uh, your website and they'll actually host the fonts for you so you don't have to worry about downloading the fonts pointing to them you know they just give you a code snippet and you're ready to go so that makes it really really easy um, another really cool site is the League of Movable Type uh, these guys are really trying to uh, get designers or font designers to come come forward with high quality open source fonts and host them here on the site and then they distribute them for free. Um, so, you know, a, a big complaint from a lot of designers is that, you know, fonts are really expensive, especially people who are either freelance or work at a really small company. If they want to get really good high quality fonts to use in their projects, you know, they have to spend thousands of dollars. So what they want to do here is really, you know, get this movement going of if you're a font designer, you might consider you know, licensing your stuff for free and giving it away, and then, you know, other people are free to take it and improve upon it or change it. <clears throat> um, so a lot, I think almost all of these uh, sources here all license their fonts, and they're this thing called the Sill Open Font License. Uh, so if you go to this URL here, they have a very in-depth description of what the um, font means, but I'm going to go ahead and read uh, the, the League of Movable Type has a, they have a manifest on their page, and uh, this description here, um, you know, it means that you're allowed to use fonts personally or commercially as long as you credit the original creator, and if you made tweaks and changes to the typefaces, and any new typefaces resulting from it should be licensed under the same terms. That way all of our fonts and any new resulting from them will always be open. So I really like the way they summed up this license. Um, and uh, it, it's yet to be seen how, how, how well this is going to be adopted by people, but uh, I think we can all agree that we really enjoy what Drupal has done for open source software. So um, if we can do the same thing for getting high quality free fonts, um, I think we can all agree that will be a really good thing. All right, so now let's get into the uh, nitty gritty of exactly how it's all going down and um, why browser support has been a problem in the past and how it's getting a little bit easier. So here's the ones that we talked about earlier. And here's how they get broken down into the browser support. Um, so you can see EOT uh, is supported. Um, now I'm listing just the most recent font, um, browsers. Um, we can get into a little bit about what the back support has been for these things. For EOT, all you need to know is that it's supported since IE4 and it's still supported in IE9. And IE9 is the only uh, Microsoft browser that's actually supporting other things besides EOT. So you can hear, you can see that they're actually supporting uh, open type fonts and then the new uh, WAF standard. Um, TTF and OTF are the most widely supported. Um, SVG, um, 
there's very limited cases why you would use that. Um, for a long time, you were only using it for um, I, uh, iOS 4.1 and earlier, but uh, as of 4.2, they now support true type fonts. So um, I think, you know, as um, 4.2 is more widely adopted, um, and I'm pretty sure that'll be the case really soon, I, I think we'll be able to get rid of SVG fonts altogether. Um, and another, there's another browser on here that's not mentioned um, is Android. Um, when I get into talking about the different font face methods, uh, we'll talk about Android a little bit. Um, I, it's actually, there's very, very little documentation about what uh, uh, font formats Android supports, but I think all you need to know is that it's going to, is, I think it supports uh, true type. So you don't have to worry about any other obscure things like SVG. Um, I think they are on board with uh, supporting the wild, uh, widely accepted stuff. Um, so we talked about all the different font formats that you need to kind of, you know, be cross browser compatible. Uh, so a lot of times when you have a font, though, they're just, when you buy one, they're just giving you the true type format or the open type format. So in a way to build your EOT, your WAF, uh, your SVG, um, there's this really awesome tool called the font face generator. And it's that uh, last link at the bottom uh, through font scroll. And so all you do is go into the website, you upload your true type font or open type font, and it'll actually build this kit for you. And so the kit will give you all these different formats. It'll even give you the JavaScript snippet for Kufon if you want, if you want it. It'll give you the HTML uh, snippets for, as like a demo, and then the CSS showing you how to like implement it. Oh, so you have a question? Do yes. You, do you need to use this to make an EOT compatible font if you want to use the font in IE? Um, this, is, this is one tool you can use to create the EOT, yeah. Because IE always supports EOT. Right. Yeah, well, IE9, which I guess is still in beta, will support true type. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but if you want to be, yeah, obviously you want to be a backwards compatible for stuff before IE9. So yeah, this, this would be a way to get your EOT font, yeah. Um, there's there's an other tools. I know there's one that just creates the EOT because it's kind of converging on almost all browsers support either, like EOT is for IE and almost all other browsers support true type. So there is a tool for that, but the, it wasn't a web-based one. It's like it was, and it was Windows only. Um, so I really like this one. It's web-based. You just go on the website, upload your font, and it gives you a zip file with uh, all of these files in it. It's a really nice kit. So that's if you want to build your own. But if you go to Font Squirrel, like I was saying, they're a really good re resource for all these high-quality free fonts. They actually provide you with a font face kit for any of their fonts on their website. So you go to, you find a font that you like, and you just click the download button and that you download the kit for that. And then that's you know, a way for you to host um, you know, your own uh, files to implement font face on your own website. So um, yeah, definitely check that out. Um, does that make sense to everyone? Does anyone have any questions so far? Okay. <clears throat> okay, so now I'm gonna show you how to actually implement it uh, on your site. And I call it a moving target because uh, I was working on, I was kind of updating my slide deck uh, on the flight over here from Austin on Thursday. And I'm not joking, when I landed here in LA, there was a new preferred method for font face. <laughs> <laughs> so I had been using one method. Uh, I had read about one a couple of days later and I was updating my slides to switch to that one. And then that, while I was on the plane, there was a blog post that had been written that was like, okay, all that other stuff is out the window, here's the deal. All right, so we talked about the basics. This is the bare bones way to implement font face, but it doesn't really get you all your cross browser compatibility. Um, this really talented guy, Paul Irish, uh, I actually saw him speak at uh, the design for Drupal, um, uh, the first one they had in Boston. And he kind of gave a similar thing about the state of web photography and give you a sense of things. You know, I think that was just two years ago and his preferred thing was Kufon. So um, it's come a long way. Um, so this is the one I actually uh, used to support. Um, you see it's got a little silly thing in there. It actually has a smiley face in the code. Um, yeah, it's for real. Um, <laughs> I could get into it. Uh, if you go to this link at the bottom here, there's a really long explanation about why you did it. Basically, it's like 
a way to like not if you have a local font installed on your computer it's a way to like make sure your local font isn't confused like if you have a local font on your machine it's going to make sure that you're using the host version instead of your local font it's like you always want to use the one that the web designer is providing for you instead of the local one so this was a trick to like trick the operating system into like hey just ignore this declaration but it's a, it's a it's a hack and um up until a couple of weeks ago, it was probably the preferred method to do things. Um, but so after you go to Paul Irish's site, he actually re is going to recommend one of these newer uh, versions that I'm going to talk about. Um, so then this guy, Richard Fink, um, came along and he called his method the Mo Bulletproofer method. Um, his was nicer because you didn't, uh, he basically did some research and was like, hey, we don't need to do the local font declaration, or declaration at all. So I'm just going to throw that out the window. Um, but you need to do this double declaration thing. Um, oh, another thing with uh, Paul Rush's method is it's not Android compatible. So that, you know, as Android started blowing up, it just wasn't acceptable anymore. So uh, <clears throat> Richard came out with this method. Um, and this is the one that I was going to present on, but it's been superseded. Um, and I'm actually glad because, as you can see, having to do this for every single font family you want to declare, having to do this, declare, you know, declaring it twice isn't really sustainable. It's going to be a big headache. So I'm actually glad that uh, it was just superseded, and uh, he's probably glad too. So here's the new one, the new bulletproof method. Um, this is by a guy named Ethan. He's the guy that runs um, Font Squirrel, and he also has a new font uh, web font store called FontSpring. And on their blog post, is, I think they just posted it on Thursday. Uh, so this is a new method. So you would declare your font family. So I'm kind of running you through this. Uh, you would declare your font family here. Uh, this next line is where you would uh, de um, declare the font for Internet Explorer. And so you'll see a little uh, odd character here. It's a question mark. If I remember correctly, um, even if you... So Internet Explorer is dumb, right? Even if you're telling it, hey, Internet Explorer, look for this first uh, EOT font, it gets confused because it keeps on seeing all these other lines here. It'll actually skip this one, even though that's the one it's only, that's the only one it's compatible with. It'll try to uh, implement these other versions. So this is a little bit of a hack that's like, hey, I got your EOT file. Here's this little question mark. Just stop there, right? So that'll take care of Internet Explorer. <laughs> This next line. Can't, uh, handle, can't handle questions. Yeah. They made all the decisions. Yeah. <laughs> no um, so this next line is uh, the WAF, and so you actually don't need to do this one since most since most of the, all the other browsers strip, support true type, but um, WAF is going to probably going to be the the most preferred one by foundries and. Um, you know, IE9, I don't think, you know, I don't think they're going to be supporting TrueType anytime, or I guess they support it now, but I think we're going to see that WAF is really going to be the predominant um, standard to emerge from all of this stuff. So um, they're going ahead and declaring it there, and you, so you, you tell it where it is, and then you tell it what uh, format it is as well. Uh, do the same thing for the TrueType, tell it format true, true, true type. Um, and then if you want to support older uh, iOS devices, you do your SVG. Um, you'll see this is not actually hack. You see the little hash mark with the name after it. This is actually something you need to do to define uh, SVG files. Um, to get what this name is, it's a little bit tricky. You actually, so if you don't already have this code supplied by Google Web Fonts or your font face kit, um, and you need to figure out what this name is right here, you can open up the SVG file in a text editor and it'll actually have um, a thing in there called like font ID, and that's what you'll put after the hash mark. <clears throat> and then you just tell it uh, SVG. Um, and if you want to kind of read about the whole process of how they got to this, I've got the URL here at the bottom. Um, but as of Thursday, um, Paul Irish is supporting this. Font Squirrel has moved to it. Um, mm -hmm. there, uh, I think um, Typekit, they're another font hosting service. They've switched to the, this being the most preferred. Um, so I don't know how, what, how things will change in the next week or so, but let's just say for now, this is the, <laughs> this is the preferred method. All right. Uh, does anybody have any questions? All right. 
Okay, so I talked a little about font hosting services, so we'll talk about those. Okay. What's up? Why the cat? Um, you know, he's just taking it easy. He's he's letting the font hosting services do all the work for them. I think that's fun. Yeah. <laughs> easy way out, right? Okay. So here's a few of the services. Uh, or I guess first I'll talk about uh, kind of pros and cons. So. Um, Really great thing about these guys is that they're working with a lot of foundries to get lots of fonts. So really, any of these services you go to, I'm sure you would have no problem finding, you know, really good-looking fonts. Uh, you would have to do very little coding because they host them for you and they provide you the code snippets. So really, as long as you get their service hooked up with your site, you know, whether you're using just a straight, you know, static HTML site, if you're using Drupal, um, there's some modules that you can use there to kind of link up with your Typekit account or other font service account. Um, and then all you really have to do is worry about your own CSS and how you want to implement it, um, you know, on different CSS elements or HTML elements. Um, they're kind of taking care of all the licensing, so you don't have to, like, be like, hey, you know, am I actually allowed to use this font this way? They are taking care of all that. They've, you know, set up all the relationships with all these foundries. And you know, you know, basically if their font is on their website, you know that they're allowed to use it. So, hey, no headaches there. Um, and you don't, if you're not, if you don't need these fonts for, you know, uh, print, then you don't have to worry about buying them. You're basically, uh, well, some, sometimes you have to buy them. Uh, a lot of the other ones just do a, uh, uh, like an annual, like a monthly fee, or you pay an annual fee, and you get, you know, a certain number of fonts for how whatever your plan is. Um, so yeah, the con is it's not free. Uh, some of them have you pay per font. Some of them have, hey, depending on your plan, you're actually limited to a certain number of page views. So you know, for smaller sites, that's not a big deal. But if you're serving, you know, New York Times or uh, economists, you know, you'd have to, that, that might be a, a concern. You'd actually have to get a pretty, prob you'd ha probably have to get a pretty expensive plan for any kind of, you know, high traffic site. <clears throat> so here's an example of a few different uh, services. Uh, Typekit, I think, is definitely the most predominant one. Uh, they kind of forged the way for all this stuff. And, uh, but there's been some other people following it. So uh, Font Deck um, is another one. Uh, Webfonts.fonts.com is actually owned by uh, Monotype. So I, I think that'll they'll come out with some uh, pretty high quality stuff. Uh, then Typotech and Kermis or some other services. Um, and then, like as I mentioned earlier, uh, technically the Google Web Fonts um, service is a font hosting service and it's free. Uh, and so far, it's the only one that I've seen that's free. Um, obviously, they have a lot fewer fonts. I think when they launched, they only had about twenty. I think now they're probably up to around forty or fifty, maybe. Um, and they're actually doing a good job of like tapping into some of these other resources of um, other people that are putting out uh, open source fonts. Because I think pretty much everything, they, they only host things that are open source. So that's a little bit of a limitation. But um, that's a really good service because it's a good blend of you've got all these really good fonts. They're free. And they'll host them for you. And it's just um, uh, a really slick solution. Uh, so here's another example of uh, what you can do. Everything, all the text on the page you see here is uh, is is CSS. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And this page is really. If you go to the web page, you actually scroll down the page. You know, you're like you're scrolling down like twenty thousand leagues. Um, but yeah, everything you see on here is just all pure CSS and HTML. Okay, um, is anybody, f uh, so that, that's the end of the presentation. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, are you, you going to have, are you, sorry, this is probably a stupid question, but are you going to post your presentation, like where it can be? Yeah, um, so if you go to fourkitchens.com slash, there's a top level link called presentations, or you go to slash presentations, uh, we put all, all of our slides there. Um, and I may also host it on SlideShare as well. Sure.
because uh, right now, like, they think that we work through it. Like, absolutely, this is the race to like the 99 cents tax. Like, everyone's just trying to be out there. But I mean, With the web fonts and pricing, have you seen that there's been a lot of competitive pricing going on? Or are, are they pretty keen in and kind of keeping the waters calm? I think it really depends on the foundry. Um, so they're pretty consistently yeah. foundry in the pricing? No. <laughs> um, I would say if you pick someone like, uh, and I'm sorry if I'm going to butcher the present, uh, pronunciation here, like Huffler, Huffler, Frere Jones, their fonts are, you know, you could pay $100 for each variant of a font. So if you wanted to get a whole, all 15 variants, you pay $1,500. You know. So it depends on the designer. Yeah, and then I've seen some other uh, kind of smaller shops or that, you know, have been either less renowned or haven't been around as long, um, and they'll, they might price their fonts at you know thirty dollars or fifty dollars. Um, Are there any like font bundles or like cool events like in the Mac world? There's like these like you know kind of bundles of software that you price seventeen of those. Um, no. You, one thing you will see is that usually if they have a uh, a font family that they're selling and you know maybe say they have like ten variations of that font, they'll usually give away two of them for free. So like they'll give away one the you know like the they'll give away like the bold weight and the bold italic weight for free to give you kind of a no for just for free you can go on and it's you know on these uh, font I mean you have to create an account usually but um you know you create an account and the you know the price tag is free you add it to the cart you download it it's free and so like that's a way to like you know hey if you like this font you know maybe you should and if you really like this font it's a way to like you know you try it you like this font you want the other weights and then you buy them um, but as far as like um, the way the the method of these font hosting services, um, Typekit definitely. Um, let me get this here. Um, you can see. Oh, another thing I forgot to mention is a lot of these font hosting services actually will have a free plan. It's usually very limited. They'll give you. You can use it only on one domain. You maybe only. Yeah. So you can see you only can use two fonts per site. Um, but it's at least a, a good way to let you like trial the service and see if you like it. Um, yeah. And then you can see like really, I mean, their most expensive plan is a hundred bucks a year. And I would say even for a freelance designer, that's that's a pretty good deal. Um, you can use it on unlimited websites, unlimited fonts per site. Like that's a pretty sweet deal. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, especially for small stuff. Yeah, I think that's really great. Um, now, is it per website? Uh, the pricing? Um, so you can see the personal one, which is twenty five dollars a year. You only you can only use it on two websites, and then there's, you, know, you can see that they're you know telling you to do the uh, portfolio package because you, that's the first tier that has limited websites. So, I've got a question. Sure. I tried fonts, the web font service, when first came out, and one thing that I didn't like is the rendering, the page would load. And then, and then there would be like a splash, and then the font would look, and it was really nice. It was like totally unusual. And I was wondering if that's something you've encountered, and um, that's kind of my hesitation of using some of these hosted services. Yeah, I was just reading something on the blog type, um, on, the, on the Typekit blog. They, I forgot what they called it, um, but it's, it, it addresses this, and it's like it's different states of. It's like, yes. No, I was. Oh. I was I'm waiting for you to finish. Okay. Uh, they had, uh, it was like different states. It's like, is the font, like things to do in cases of the font not loading yet. And obviously, you know, you set up your font stack. So it's like, you know, here's my preferred web font that I want loaded. If that, you know, if that doesn't work for whatever reason, you know, fall back to Helvetica, then Arial, then Sans there. Um, I don't have the link up, but it was definitely on the, the Typekit blog. It's the uh, web font loader thing that uh, Google and yeah. And basically, it's a um, it's the it's a JavaScript file. So what it will do is you specify either your Typekit ID or Google, whatever it is, along with the fonts that it's loading. And um, what it will do is it will put a state, like you just said, with each font. So once it's finished downloading, you can start viewing that uh, particular text or whatever within that font at that point. Mm -hmm. And until then, it will show a default state of whatever power you want to run. And the good thing about that is, um, is that because different browsers render um, downloaded fonts in a different way, like um, IE and I think Safari, 
won't display the font until it's actually finished downloading that font. Um, the web font builder will show the default font across all the browsers until it's finished downloading and then show it. Or you can change um, your CSS rulings to not show the font until it's finished downloading and then switch over to using it. And like I said, it's consistent across the browsers that way. So is it just for using fonts on the Google service or can you use it with any of the you can, services? You can use it with any. Um, I'm actually going to talk about it in the box because I made a lot of well, I, I think, you know, my question is, like, how can these things be cached and where and how can you take advantage of it? Is, like, so is there any way of, uh, of uh, fooling this thing into thinking you need everything before you even start so that, so that it starts downloading everything before it even starts rendering the page, you start rendering the page? Uh, is, there, is there any way of, you know, stacking the deck in your favor? Um, I don't know if there's been, I don't know if there's been much concern about that. Um, the, the one concern, the only one I had seen is like if you were going to be rendering a really large piece of type on your web page, um, I saw that it was suggested that you would use that local font decoration because in that case it actually would be faster that, you know, if the user has the font, that if they were, you know, if they were loading Arial or Helvetica off their local desktop, it would render much quicker sure. than on that. But um, other than that, I haven't seen uh, other like caching concerns or things like that. I mean, would you really use this to to call Arial as your font? I mean, oh no. Yeah. So. No. Um, right. <laughs> uh, and I was trying to find that link, but. I don't see it. I, I know it's back in November, so I think I'm getting close. But uh, any other any other questions? Yeah, a TypeScript module. Are there other um, what other stuff exists for Drupal to make it easy to implement? Any of those? So glad you asked. Um, this module right here is called Font Your Face. <clears throat> Uh, so what this allows you to do is it allows you to type uh, tap into all of these different services. So obviously for things like Typekit and Kernist uh, and Font Deck, you would need an account, and it would actually you would, you know they give you like a little API key for your website, and then you put it on the, your mm -hmm. Drupal uh, configuration, and then allows you, that gives you access to all of your Typekit files that you you know you like w when you're. When you have a Typekit account, you know you add certain files, to, certain fonts to your library, and so as you add those in, uh, your with this with the help of this module, it would pull those into your Drupal website, so you would have access to them to use in your designs. Um, but for things like the Google Font API and uh, Font Squirrel, since these um, ones you don't need an account for, um, if you just enable them on the site, it'll just automatically pull them all into your uh, the, in the font browsing interface, and you can kind of check off the ones that you want to use. Uh, on your site. Uh, were you going to demo font your face tomorrow for the month? Okay. Um, I'll, I'll leave it to Ashok to do that. I got a quick question. I, I used a type kit, but I actually put the, um, the JavaScript into my TPL file. Is there anything wrong with that? I copied the um, theme and no. so it's a sub theme. No. Um, I think this is probably for like less, you know, this is more like less technical uh, okay, okay. users and designers. Uh, and obviously this is, you know, it if you're not going to be using all of these services, if you're only going to be using Typekit, it probably makes sense to just do that. And they actually used to have uh, just a Typekit module. I mean, they still have it, but they discontinued the the maintainer has discontinued it in favor of uh, the Font Your Face, which you know supports multiple services. Um, but yeah, is, is your is your session going to be tomorrow or today? Uh, or your your buff. Both. Both? Okay, great. <laughs> I, I love talking about type, so I'll talk about it every day. Um, all right, great. Yeah, uh, yeah. So definitely check out that boff. Um, the interface is a little kludgy for font your face, but um, I'm trying to make it one of my personal missions to kind of work with him to kind of clean that up, um, as you do in open source projects. So. Um, I think that's any other anything else?
probably running out of. Is the bot scroll bot generator getting updated when they're new? Yeah, the guy who wrote that method owns, he runs font scroll and font spring. So he, yeah, his, it's obviously his preferred method now. So um, this is what the font scroll website looks like. And you can see that uh, any font that you go to, so you're like, oh, I want Rapscallion. There's a link here for the font face kit. And you click on that. You can actually choose which formats you want to get. And then you just download it and you got your zip file. Yep, and so there's all the files that you need for your kit. So you just drop those into your uh, theme file and you're ready to go. Uh, then conversely, you can see they have a top level link for their font face generator. And this is kind of where you go through and, um, you know, add edit fonts uh, locally to uh, build your own kit. Just one quick question. I had some issues with the uh, pipe kit one day. They've been really good as a service, but one day their service was out, so all my fonts defaulted back to an Arial, and it was like out for like six hours, and it was a real bummer. <laughs> um, so it looks like that might actually, the font scroll might be a better way to render the font. Yeah, I mean, one of the issues of depending on any hosted service for anything is that you're always at the whim of the uptime of their servers. So it's always a matter of, you know, convenience versus, you know, yeah. you know things. Cause you know, if you're hosting your own website, you know, and it's up, and you're hosting your own sites, you know, as long as your the website's up, you know, your fonts are yeah, going to be yeah. there too. So, um, yeah, obviously, for more technical people like myself, I'm definitely a big fan of just creating my own kits, um, especially if uh, I'm doing a design for a client and they have already purchased the fonts for me, and then I can just turn it into a kit and use it on there. You know. Um, you know, if they have a very specific font they need, you know, you, obviously that's the way you have to go. Instead of trying to go to the font hosting service, then maybe they will have yeah, it in their yeah. library, you know. And if you can make sure you're advising clients, like when you are choosing custom fonts, to let them know that it's going to default if the service ever goes down because <coughs> the client might freak out because their site's broken or something like that. You know, you don't, you don't need yeah. someone, you know, yelling fire, you know, when there really isn't, you know, it's like, oh, that's no, just a minute, you know, stuff like that. So, just be aware that if the client you know, doesn't know that there's one day it might just refer to a standard font. Um, and the reason, I mean, trying to explain stuff to clients sucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, I know it's like one more extra thing, but just like you know, like, look, this is a fancy font. You know, some people might not all see it, but it will, to its best ability, you know, <coughs> display this way. You know, yeah. And that it's safe, stuff like that. So, because I, I, I know I've, I've kind of seen this, like, you know, I'm like, oh. Somebody's changing my website. Somebody's changing this. It's like, no, 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 no. Yeah. 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 I, got, I got another question. With Font Squirrel, how's the rendering on Windows Vista? Um, I'm not familiar. Is, is, when is, does Vista have something specific? No, I was like, this, the rendering with the typekit was pretty. Meh. I think it's more browser. I think it's more browser based than operating system specific on the rendering quality because I mean there there's the like clear type stuff but I think that's I don't know if that extends to browsers necessarily yeah I mean it shouldn't be any different whether it's a uh, just a standard web font or yeah, a yeah, font yeah. from this that's going to render the same yeah okay there's an influence of the, uh, the operating system level but I think it's kind of like it's all Windowsy or it's all Mac -y. yeah or with the more of a value version more than the other browsers that are installed on very, really uh, subtle stuff like turning the rack is a bit more advanced on, on that. But that's because of the clientele design. Cool. Any other questions for Eric? When you're downloading the font scroll stuff, they list every base as a different font family in the actual font base declaration. Right. And I could put them all the same and then use the old. Um, I think that's a per um, per browser situation. Some browsers are okay with you just doing, you know, font weight bold, uh -huh. and it will and it'll recognize, hey, I have the bold version of that font. But I think for 
at least for right now, for maximum uh, cross-browser compatibility, you do need to, in your font families, you need to, or in your font face declarations, you need to specify each weight individually. So how does that work then with sort of backwards compatibility when the font goes down or something? Because I can't put bold in my headlines because I'm only bolding a bolded font. I, um, Which is totally great. I mean, you list that first, and then you can list, you know, in order what yeah. you default to if that's not available. I don't know if I've I don't know if I've tried bolding an already bolded uh, font face, so I'm not sure how that works. <laughs> um, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh right. If you have some more generic, yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, I definitely haven't, I, I haven't, no, I don't know. I, I haven't done a whole lot of experimentation about this stuff, but there are definitely people who have, and there's like really, really long threads where people go into, I mean, especially these three guys that are creating these three prominent syntaxes are like constantly going back and forth and like, you know, finding all this, all these quirks, you know, so it, it, it's out there for sure. <laughs> Boy, uh, I haven't. Um, I, I've never heard of this BlackBerry thing. <laughs> I've never used the BlackBerry uh, in any in any of this uh, any of the research I've done related to this. I've never seen anything mentioned about BlackBerry. <laughs> Um, I, I realize now that, you know, they do have, you know, with the, you know, now that they have, like, the touchscreen phones and stuff and color displays and all that now. Um, We're using webcam. It actually is. Not, a, right? And some of the newer Blackberries. I, 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 I had a webcam uh, site that I'm moving now and I tried the Blackberry and it failed, so I don't know if it's fully supported. But I think the way the, the Blackberry would have to work is um, I, I used to have one. You would install it in your browser. If you're really doing web uh, browsing stuff, then you rely on the browser application that's in the BlackBerry. Opera. But, yeah, actually, you would probably just install Opera. Yeah. I didn't try that. It's a default one. I didn't mention Opera. And if anybody does use Opera, this, all, all of the, it, it, like, since, like, I think version 9 or 10, all, all of this stuff is supported, all the font-based stuff. If it makes you feel better, font scroll looks pretty awesome. <laughs> I have right. It does work all, all these fonts load. Just get a new phone. All, like, yeah. 30 fonts that are so a little announcement. Um, we're doing lunch at one, and the next session will be uh, Todd's going to present pretty soon here. And I'm sure he's going to go, but I can't, which room are you going to use? The trailer. Okay, over to the trailer, which is across through the, through the live set, uh, to talk about Google Font Loader and other um, similar tools for um, this kind of stuff. <coughs> and we talk to Great, thanks. I've got, I got one more thing. Uh, first person that can name, the, the, the next slide, first person that can name the font wins a prize. And I'm actually going to give you a hint. Is this Arial or Helvetica? Neither. Somebody raise their hand who's going to guess? Helvetica. Wrong. <laughs> it's Arial. Yes. You win a prize. Uh, <laughs> actually, do you, do you use balsamic? Are you familiar with balsamic mockups? Oh, nice. Oh, I heard of it. Okay, you, do, you just got a license for it. Wire yeah. yeah. All right, thank you, everybody. Aaron, don't forget to press stop, and then it'll just take like two, three minutes. Yep. Yes.